All right. Let me do this. Let me do this introduction before everything crashes on me here. Um, well, welcome back to Smoothies with Rufus and my my new look and improved tag team partner, Corey Hecht. Notice the blonde hair. He's trying to be a internet influencer now. And uh, so he's changed his look a little bit. I don't know if he looks any tougher or any meaner, but it looks like his hair is a little bit longer than the last time I saw him in person. So, yeah, viewership has been down the last couple of months, so we just viewership's been down the last couple of months, so we just had to change something up. I figured this was the best thing to do. There you go. This is the best thing to do. There you go. And that, that, that might be a good move. Um, but we have our special guest, Mike Camperini. Campo, as we like to call him. I didn't know his last name. I didn't even know he had a last name or a first name for a long time. And uh, uh, Campo, why don't you, uh, I know you've been on before, but let's uh, give him a little refresh on what you're doing and what you've been up to, and then we'll just start. Sure. Um, so I'm a PT slash trainer out in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, I've been doing strength conditioning for a while now. I've been a PT for oh three years now. Um, I don't know. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I feel like I've done been in a lot of different settings. Um, I think the last time I was talking to you guys, I was in like a a post surgical kind of setting. Now I'm kind of doing my own thing and doing like the independent game and the cash based PT game, which I'm having a lot more fun doing. That's definitely for sure. So uh, that's that's kind of the update so far. So, well, that that's awesome. So, what what uh, what what's your clientele look like? Uh, right now, it's a little bit of everything. So, I actually did have one guy who got his shoulder replaced. So, I still sometimes do post op uh, cases. Um, recently, I've had a lot of uh, pro basketball guys come in and girls, for that matter. So, I'm doing a mix of. Uh, Rehab for some of them, training for some of them, a little bit of both for some of them. So that's been fun. And then I do a lot of uh, online stuff. So I'll do a lot of online um, programming, a lot of online calls. And then even for um, for athletes, for gen pop, stuff like that, I'll, uh, let's say, you know, I have baseball guys come in for the off season and then I'll continue to program, program for them virtually um, for their in-season stuff. And then I'll just have random people from all over reach out to me to get treatment or get a, get a program or something like that. So a little, little bit of everything, whatever's going to pay the bills. So it's working out so far. That, that's awesome. Now, now I got a whole, that just, just opened up a whole bunch of questions for me. Oh boy. Um, all right. What's Hopefully the... I'm ready. <laughs> are you still, um, are you still, uh, you were working with golfers, I think, last time. You still doing some of that, too? Uh, I got a couple golfers on my schedule. I'm working with them. I actually, earlier today, I just shot a video because um, we're Mike, Mike K and I are doing, like, the Substack thing right now. So we're um, making some more, like, videos about some of the clients that we work with. And so I shot a video about um, this golfer I'm working with and what are some of my thought processes for programming for him and – where he was before and where he is now and, you know, taking everything into consideration, I guess you could say. So. Sure. Well, good. Um, Corey, you got any questions to start us off with? Sure. Let's just, let's start more general. Cause last time we talked, I think was on here was like two years ago. Yeah. When you're at that ortho clinic, like, sure. like what would you just say generally, has changed in terms of your approach over the last couple of years, just being in different settings, working with different clientele? Um, honestly, I think my options for what I'm able to do with them have kind of opened up. So the tricky part in your usual insurance-based clinic is that you have a huge um, time constraint that you can work with people. And so that kind of hinders how much you can really get done with them. So if I was able to get, you know, three, four, maybe five things done with that person, that was kind of a, a really good day. Um, and then it was always very 
much more so focused towards like the rehabilitative side. And so we weren't really able to push past that boundary just because, you know, as soon as they were rehabilitated, um, it was high time for me to discharge them and either refer them to someone else or um, to make sure that they were ready enough or educated enough for the next step. Uh, now I'm kind of running the full gamut and I'm able to do a heck of a lot more with all the people that I'm working with and then covering like that full spectrum whether it's through my entire relationship with them or even throughout like the session itself, just because I have more time to work with that person, we can kind of go through the, go, go through everything or anything I would want to do with them previously. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Would you say you have like a typical session flow or does it really depend on who's coming in and what they're coming in for? Yeah, it kind of, kind of depends on the person. So for some people it's we're, it's going to look like your typical training session for other people. It might be like half on like the rehab side, half on the training side for others. We've been able to kind of sprinkle a little bit of everything into the whole day. So, you know, that, that kind of example would look like they might do their typical warm up that they would do. And then if I'm trying to facilitate, changes on a certain exercise or execution on a certain exercise, I can kind of mix in more of like the annual therapies, the rehabilitative side of things into their workouts. So that's been actually great in terms of outcomes and stuff like that. I've been able to facilitate a lot of changes. So it's, like I said, it kind of depends on what I'm seeing, what that person needs help with, stuff like that. So I think that's interesting, just having the option to go from all the manual stuff to like all of your higher level training stuff. So like how, how are you integrating the manual in within a training session? Like if you have any specific examples. I do. So I'm rehabbing a partial Achilles tear right now for a basketball player. And so first thing we do is when she comes in, cause we're also trying to kind of co-manage this while she's trying to make a team. And so we, couldn't really pump the brakes too much on basketball stuff just because she kind of had to be ready to go at a moment's notice. So we had to make sure that she was still doing on court stuff while we're still trying to rehab the Achilles and everything like that. So depending on how she's feeling when she's coming uh, off the court for the next day, she'll see me first. And so if we have to do more of like a rehab side of things, then we'll tone it down a little bit more that day. But lately we've been able to ramp her up and progress her pretty well. So a lot of the time that day, like a typical training day will kind of look like um, she'll come in. I'll do like a quick assessment on her. It's really just like two or three range of motions at this point that I need to keep track of. Um, and then we have a really good idea of what interventions I need to do for that. So for her um, kind of based on her presentation, she had a, a heel bone or calcaneus that was, heavily oriented into supination, honestly, to the point where it was starting to create a bony change to the heel bone itself. So it was almost, if you're looking at the back of her heel and let's say like this part of my hand is her heel bone, it's, it was honestly starting to almost curve or banana, if you will. That's kind of how I describe it to her. Um, so depending on the extent of that, I'll do some manual therapies to try to unbend that. And then, what we'll do from a training perspective is because that heel bone was situated to enabling her to go into the cut rather quickly and rather aggressively. Now all of her training and all of her manual is focused on pushing her out of the cut. And that's essentially the, the biggest things that we've been, been uh, training for her. So there we go. Can you dive into that a little bit more just in terms of like you're recognizing there's a potential bony change and then this this calcaneus is going to be more biased towards supination. So when you're when this is kind of going through your head, what are you thinking in terms of like, why is it so important that they need to be able to have the option to go the other way? And what is that going to mean for this person in terms of what they have to do for their sport? Sure. So um, it, it starts with a, a bunch of stuff, right? So I do my my orthopedic assessment. So she comes in, she comes in with complaints about her Achilles. So already that's kind of cluing me into like, all right, well, I should probably look at her foot 
And what does her foot look like when she's doing certain activities, right? And so you look at her foot and you see that it's oriented much more so into supination. So she's pretty much hanging out on the outside of her heel. Um, she has a lot of swelling on the lateral aspect of the Achilles as well. So whether the, the tear itself is, is, is encouraging that or that was uh, there previously, I genuinely don't know just because I wasn't following her for her whole life uh, watching her play basketball, right? But uh, based on how she moves on the court where she exaggerates that shape of her foot and then her typical presentation and her complaints in terms of the, the swelling and the tenderness in that area, um, that kind of clues me into what I need to do next in terms of an intervention. So if she's going into that cut very quickly, very aggressively and almost staying there, you can kind of imagine the uh, amount of energy that's essentially accumulating in that Achilles tendon. And it would start to make sense as to why that, that uh, area is starting to become aggravated or potentially uh, disrupting a, a constraint to the tissue. So. so if you're going into the cut and you're accumulating energy in that area, but you don't have the, the motion to then push out from that area, does that, like, what is that potentially telling you? So the the classic example of like a heavily supinated foot would be like an ankle sprain so it's so biased towards supination that as they go into the cut the energy of that movement going let's say we're going into that right side all of the energy and the momentum into that movement uh continues or perpetuates into that direction just based on the positioning of that of that joint. So it's enabling that movement to continue. If I need to then take that energy from that movement, so I'm going into the cut and then I need to project it up and to the left in order to get out of that cut, there's certain positions or shapes that my body has to create in order to then absorb or redirect that energy. So she's really good right now at absorbing that energy but she hasn't redirected it. So it's just continually being absorbed in that region every single time she uh, puts her foot on the ground in, a, in an aggressive athletic movement. So you're using manual techniques sometimes to help give her access to be able to push out of the cut better. And then yes. how are you determining where to go next from more of an exercise intervention standpoint? So we kind of just progress her from where she has the capacity to demonstrate the, the position with her foot, right? So because she does have a, a constraint issue, we know that there is detriment to the structure. There's a partial tear of her Achilles. She's going to struggle to maintain some of the, the shape and position of the foot that we're trying to create for. So I'm kind of giving her training wheels and taping her foot so that her heel bone starts to reshape itself and turn in and go into a little bit more eversion um, to enable her to push out of the cut. So that's already one, giving her a cue or a feel of like, oh, okay, here's the inside of my heel. This is what it would feel like to help push out of that cut previously. She didn't have a feel for that before. And then I'm continuing to use constraints in the exercise selection to help with that as well. So if I need her pushing out of a cut in that direction, uh, I'm just going to take a ramp and then put her foot along that side of the ramp to encourage her to continue to push out of that cut. So I'll literally have her, what was like the first exercise we started doing? Um, I'd put her right foot on a ramp and she'd do like a side shuffle, like two side shuffles to the left. And because her foot is already positioned in a more everted position on that ramp and she has the tape on her foot, it was kind of like, all right, if she screws up this activity, um, all bets are off in terms of her being able to like learn this stuff because I'm putting everything in the environment into place so that she's able to access the kind of position with her foot that I really wanted to. So essentially like making it very, very, very hard for her to fail or for not for her to not feel that kind of position that we want 
And then you just kind of build the exercise from there at that point. When you say feel, like, are you having her, like, what do you, what exactly do you mean by feel? Like, are you telling her to, like, she's thinking about a certain thing or is she like, you're trying to get her to push from a certain area? In, initially, yes. So, and so this will kind of go into like the exercise selection as well. So I'll start with, so we'll do the manual. And while I'm doing the manual therapy, I'll say, do you feel my pressure on the inside of your heel? Do you feel how that's moving your foot in this direction? She says, yes. I say, okay, great. Then I tape her foot in the same position. And I say, do you feel how the tape is putting your heel in the same position that my hands were? And she says, yes. And I say, great. And then I put her foot on the ramp. And I say, do you feel the same inside part of the foot that I was just working on on the table? She says, yes. I say, great. Push yourself off of the ramp with that. And then after those three things of, you know, bringing her slowly through that progression, I then start to make it a little bit more of a reactive activity. So now I'm, we might start with, okay, let's go off the ramp. I'm going to wrap a band around you, pull you towards me. So pulling you right to left, and that's going to assist her in pushing off of that right foot, but I'm not going to say okay feel the inside of the heel then go feel the inside of the heel then go i'm going to make it a little bit more rhythmic create a pattern to it and after we were just working on the same stuff of where she needs to feel with her foot that should translate into the other activity that's a little bit more uh, fast paced not enabling her to have to think about every single thing every single time she's moving so i love it Anything Thanks. you want to follow up with, Rufus? Uh, no, keep going. You're fine. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to digest all this stuff. You know, I'm thinking, okay, I can see it in my head, right? And uh, um, just trying to look at it from my standpoint and how I could how I could look at it. So, no, you guys are doing great. Go ahead. You got any more questions, Corey? One yeah. Um, let's let's uh, diverge a little bit. Like, so this was a specific case where this person had like a partial Achilles tear, and you're looking at a specific bony change at the the joint in that area. Mm -hmm. Are there ever cases where someone's coming in for like say pain or discomfort in a certain area, but your main KPIs or areas you're working on are away from that specific area? Sure. Yeah, all the time. So even even for this case, I mean, we can we can kind of keep it with her. We got to now also think about, OK. If I'm trying to change how that heel bone is situated. Is there anything else that is acting in a manner in her body that is enabling that joint position to uh, emerge or to create that kind of situation, right? Okay, if my goal, if my main goal right now in rehab is to change that, then I need to address those other things as well in order to hedge my own bets of making sure that we're creating the changes that we want, right? I always, the analogy I always give patients or clients is like, okay, well, if the whole reason I'm working on the your left lower back or your left rib cage or for her it was like her left shoulder blade is because of this uh action or if this behavior in this area is pushing you over to that right side and we're trying to push you off of that right side i want to make sure that we're continually making changes in order to enable that it, it's it's like training with anything else like if my if I'm a bodybuilder and my whole goal is hypertrophy, I'm going to try to create an entire training atmosphere and an entire training environment to focus on that one soul adaptation. So same thing with the rehab world. If, I, if my adaptation that I'm trying to go for to create is um, right pronation or a right heel bone that is going more towards internal rotation, I need to hedge every single one of those bets to make sure that that adaptation is what we're actually creating, right? So 
So are there are there ways you build this into your assessment process to get an idea of like, yeah, there's a certain area we may be focusing on, but there's going to be other influences. So like, do you have ways you've built into your assessment process how these other influences may impact how you're going to get the change in that certain area? Uh, for sure. So I'll I'll do range of motions. So like chess boards, as Bill calls them. Still doing, been doing them for a while. Um, probably won't stop doing them because they're pretty useful. Um, Never go away from the basics. Absolutely. So and then what else? So for what I've found extremely valuable for patients as well, it's like, right, yeah, it's, for some people, it's meaningful that I can show them, hey, your right hip external rotation was 20 when you first saw me. Now you're coming in at 60. And for me, that's great. Maybe for another physical therapist, that'd be great. For her, this is like the first time she's ever heard what right hip ER is, and she doesn't know what's good or what's bad. She has no reference for that, right? So what I'll start doing for a lot of these patients is I'll just take pictures. I'll do posture before and after pictures, front, back, side, side, um, or I'll videotape them doing certain movements. And so that will help me uh, see the things that I need to see, as well as, okay, here's here's my chessboard, here's the measurements of what I think is going on, and then here's the posture pictures. Does that also factor into what I'm seeing as well? So do those two kind of correlate? If so, great, I know that that's giving me clues as to, yes, I'm on the right track. And then if we create the changes that I'm looking for, I now have uh, visual evidence for the patient for me to say, hey, you remember when I was talking about how your left side was doing this and because of that, your right side's doing that? Well, here, this is, I, I, when I'm saying that, I can see that in my head, but now I need you to see it in your head because now that makes the learning process way easier. That builds their buy-in just to make sure that I'm not full of it, right? Because a lot of this stuff is new for these people, right? They just think like, oh, I got to buy my Achilles hurts. I need you to work on my Achilles, right? So I need I need some sort of um, message to show them, yeah, like there's a reason why I'm kind of pulling on your left arm right now. It's because of this change that we just created, right? So that that's also been a big big part as well for the for the client. And taking this approach, have you noticed a lot of changes in not just like your more rehab KPIs, but also like your performance measures? Um, yes. Currently, I don't have great means of measuring some of that, but when I am able to measure it, yes. Because again, so essentially I'm just doing, I'm doing science. And so in order to form a hypothesis and confirm or disapprove that hypothesis. I need multiple measurements or multiple means of um, objectivity to say, yes, you're on the right track or no, you're full of it, right? So hypothetically, we'd have the, the rehab measurements or the rehab KPIs. We'd have some of the movement uh, KPIs and we'd have some of the performance KPIs kind of all, all correlating together to say, yes, you are on the right track. And then sometimes some of them are correct. And then other times only two of them are correct. And then not the third one isn't tagging along. Well, all right. Maybe that is a big deal. Maybe it's not. It just kind of depends on the, the goal and the circumstance. If I'm, if I'm working with a baseball player, I change their, their movement profile, but their performance profile doesn't change in terms of what their pitches are doing and stuff like that. Was that the right kind of adaptation that we needed at that point in time? Honestly, probably not. So it, it's fun for us to like change all these range of motions, but we got to make sure that, and same thing for in the weight room. Like if you can make someone's vertical jump go up, but your their fastball velocity doesn't go up or their 40 time doesn't go up, but that was the true measurement that you wanted to wanted to change. Okay, yeah, you can pat yourself up on the back for changing that other adaptation, but at the end of the day, that that wasn't the 
overall adaptation that you wanted to actually make. And you, you got to be honest with yourself and saying like, all right, yeah, I, I did a thing, but it wasn't the thing that I wanted to do. Right. So, but yes, you would want to, you would want to make sure that all of those things are kind of correlating together so that, you know, your training is doing what you want it to do. Are there ways you're hedging your bets in terms of scaling up progressions to make sure that all of these KPIs from the rehab movement and performance are, are matching each other? Mm. Good question. Right. Cause it's like, I can do a manual technique and I can get a ton of range of motion back and I can say, all right, cool. Come in three times a week and we'll do this for 20 minutes, then go throw your bullpens and let's see how things look. Or I can do that and then take another approach and then kind of see what other changes I get with that as well. What what I would say is that I would I would try to work backwards. So what what is the kind of movement or kind of outcome that I want? Where are they at right now? And then how do I build them from where they're at to where I'm trying to get them to go? And that that's honestly tricky because for a lot of people, um, they've never been to where you're trying to get them to go right so you kind of need a little bit of experience and knowledge in terms of and almost like seeing the potential in that person in terms of what are what are they actually potentially capable of and then do i have an idea in my head of what that would potentially look like and then how do i get them there right uh rufus would have a much better idea of this just because if he's taking like a a young Olympic weightlifter who's 14 years old, he might have a premonition of what they might look like as a 17 year old weightlifter. No, no, Rufus, you can kind of talk on that a little bit more if you could. Do you, do you ever have like, you know, I see this 13 year old, but I could kind of see this is what their hand clean could look like, or this could even be what this kind of exercise would look like for that person. Yeah, I have, you know, I have a, picture in my head of what it's supposed to look like right and and so that's that's kind of what kind of what we look towards and then you know based on their on their body or how they move you know then then you know you kind of figure it out but I think you I think I have if I'm looking at the way I want something to look it's kind of a picture that I've gained over the years of to what it's supposed to look like and compare it to what he looks like now. And then, you know, and then we are gradually working towards this picture in my head of what it's supposed to look like. All right. Is that, is that, is that, what, is that what you're talking about? I think that that kind of hits on, and this would be a good question for both you guys. Like Rufus is just talking about like someone's coming in and just based on your experience, you're getting a profile of kind of like what to expect from them. So depending on like their sport, you know, their shape and their current athleticism, you guys feel like just getting more experience and reps over the years, you have an idea of kind of maybe how, how quickly things can progress or what their, like what their potential may look like just based on kind of how, how they're coming in from that first day. Rufus, I'll let you go first on that one. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, he, he they come in and they're and they're you know they're having trouble picking up the the coordination of the movement or something and so okay you know we gotta we gotta slow this down and and teach him some coordinate some coordination things and and things like that to help it along i think it's different in my situation because they are so young and they're so pliable you know that most anything I do with them works, right? And um, uh, I think that you know you, I, I still have what I want in my head. It's just that you know how how do I get in there? And then and then and it's different for different people. You know you, I don't you don't take this it's like anything else. You don't take the same approach. And so. Um, uh, you know, I think that's 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 kind of the way it's kind of the way I look at it and design it with all the exercises that we're doing, whether it's weightlifters or football players or whatever. You know, and and uh, um, uh, you know, here's 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 the perfect model, or or what I have in my head is the perfect model, 
and then you know based, like you said based on his body shape or size or you know whatever how do we get it that close right so you know a guy who weighs 120 kilos is not going to squat exactly the same way as a guy that weighs 60 kilos you know the body type is different so you know I'm, you know, people yell at him all the time to get down lower and lower in the squat. Well, he's got so much mass, he can't get down there. Right. So that's one of the, you know, that's one of the things. Okay. I'll take that, you know, and, uh, so hopefully that answered. The Rufus, do you feel like, um, question? Cause I feel like a lot of, uh, coaches end up falling into like this cookie cutter, mentality because you kind of you touched upon like the perfect model but then also the body type kind of changes what that perfect model would look like for that person right so do you feel like that's something that um you've noticed in terms of how you've been coaching athletes so like how do you how do you try and find that uh What's this perfect model for this person? Because I agree, like body type is going to play a huge role in that. But even like people with similar body types, is that is that just something that you have like an intrinsic feel of at this point? Or was there a thought process behind it? And even if it is just like a, you feel your way through it and you have like an intuitive sense of it, like that's a, because I feel a lot of times that's part of how I'm starting to do things now. So, I mean, talk about that. No, I, I think, I think a lot of it is, is, is intuitive. Um, you know, well, you know, I, I can't explain some of the things that I know. I just see it. Right. And so, uh, uh, you know, when, when you squat, I don't want you to shove your butt all the way back to the wall. Right. Well, I can get everybody to do that. Right. But, some guys' butts are going to go back farther than others just because of the body shape. And, and so, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think, I think a lot of it is intuitive and, you know, if I had somebody like you or Corey around me, you could explain what I'm seeing, you know, and, and, and things like that. But I, th you know, I think you develop an intuition about, you know, you see it enough and you're in the gym enough and, and you're able to make, changes you know you, you just can't you just can't write a cookie cutter program right you can have the cookie cutter program as a model but you can't you can't apply it to everybody the same way and so you know then within that model then you know you you, you make the necessary changes that you have to make to do those kinds of to, to get what you want or you know to get what you can out of them right and so um uh, and so I, you 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 have you have you have those things so yeah it's okay to write the the cookie cutter model or the template or whatever they say you know for that day or that week or that cycle or you know whatever it is but you still got to be willing to make changes uh, in, in 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 what you're doing you know you got you got to be flexible enough or knowledgeable enough to be able to make those changes instead of forcing them into your program, you got to make the program around them. Does that make sense? At least that's my, how you guys feel about that. Yeah, I've, um, yeah. there's, there's a pretty cool exercise. It's called um, a Campo deadlift um, named after a pretty smart guy from what I hear, but <laughs> Um, essentially it's, it's like a staggered hinge position with one foot in front, yeah. one foot in the back. Go, go for, ahead. For the record, it was not my idea to name it that, but continue. <laughs> well, okay. not, I'm not that full of myself just to let you know. It's great. Great top point. So, but Thank essentially you. there, it's a staggered hinge position with one foot in front of uh, one foot in back and one foot in front. You're hinging toward that back leg. Well, like you can set someone up wider, narrower, narrower, one foot is way in front, one foot is, or the front foot's way in front, the front foot's closer to that person. I think just over time, I can't tell you necessarily why, like we can probably reason our way through it. But when someone sets up, I could kind of tell right away 
if this is going to be successful or not in terms of like, are they going to feel in the right place or is it going to look how it's going to look? Right. I think that's kind of what Rufus is getting at with some of this. And if you want to speak on that campo as well. Well, so it's just something I've been thinking a lot about um, just because, I mean, with, with Rufus, especially, and I always, I'll always sing his praises of like, I think he's got one of the best coaching eyes that I've seen. And it's a testament to just doing this and being actively curious about it for as long as he has. Right. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting because I, I genuinely do think what we end up creating, especially if it's like an intuitive sense of things, you almost have like this um, emotional reaction to something. Cause that like, we want to stand there all day long and pat ourselves on the back in terms of like, yeah, I thought through every single joint range of motion and I thought through their entire body and I saw every single range of motion that they had in their, in my head. And like, I, maybe other people can objectively and logically think like that within a split second, but I, I can't. So what I think I've done is essentially created sort of like this emotional valence towards a certain kind of move or a certain kind of position versus one versus the other. And it's almost kind of like, um, I don't know, like a designer or an artist kind of looking at something and being like, oh, that looks like crap or, oh, like that's actually very visually appealing to me. Right. So it's I'm always like curious as to and I'll I talk Rufus's ear off about this all the time and asking questions all the time on like, OK, how did you develop that? When did you feel like you started developing that? Because I, I, I think it's a big deal. Like it's it, it's something that I don't think we talk enough about just because yes, we want to be objective about things. But at the end of the day, a lot of our decision-making in the moment has like this emotional good versus bad versus what do I want this to look like versus not. And it's just, it's hard to, um, it's hard to develop that. And then I think that that's always changing. You know, you almost have like certain tastes, if you will. I know again, like that just sounds so non-objective, but I, I genuinely think that that's part of part of developing some of your, your coaching style, if you will. So I think, I think some of it is that you have to look deeper than the surface. You have to be curious enough to look deeper than the surface. So, you know, I've had several kids at, at, at high school that would come to me and my knee hurts when I'm squatting. Well, why does it hurt? I don't, you know, if you, do you have an injury, you know, or what? No, it just hurts when I squat. Okay, well, let me look at it. And so you start looking at it, and oh, their foot, maybe you may make an adjustment in their in their foot pressure, or something a little bit. You know, or, or you know, it could be a million things, as you know. But you know, that's just one example. And you may, and all of a sudden they look at you and you say, "Well, it doesn't hurt anymore." Oh, gee, you know, they, they look at you like, where'd you learn that? Right. And I think, I think that a lot of times people don't, I'm not blowing my own horn, but people don't try to look deeper into it. So I try, you know, okay, well, try this, see what happens. That doesn't work. Okay. Try this and see what happens. You know, and it's just kind of, Corey and I've talked about this before. It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together you know, where, where's the piece fit? And if I run out of things that to do, then I call Corey, you know, and say, Hey, you know, or I call you or, you know, whoever and say, okay, you know, I've tried this, this, and this, what do I do now? And, and so, you know, listening and talking with you and, you know, all the other guys and, and, and Corey and all the other guys I've been exposed to, I've been lucky enough to, okay, I can put some of these things together. And if it's simple, you know, in, 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 you know, your realm, if it's something simple, I can usually fix it, right? But by the same token, if it gets a lot deeper, then I got to go to one of you guys that know a lot more than I do. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, and then they, they take a look at it and say, here, try this and that. And that, excuse me, that usually fixes it. So, so I, I, I just think you have to be curious enough to say, to look, and I always start from the bottom, uh, of, of everything. So I look at the foot, you know, what's the foot placing, you know, what's the, what's the knee doing, you know, on different things. And, and, 
and kind of kind of work my way up, you know, that way till we figure out uh, what 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 the problem is. And so, um, uh, you know, it may it may be just a very slight change that you that you do, and you know, all of a sudden, gee, my knee doesn't hurt. All right, put some more weight on there and see if it's still the same. And no, nope, it's good. Okay, come to me if it ever hurts again, right? So, for sure. So I, you know, I, I think it's more of you got to be curious enough to look deeper into it, right? And and you got to be willing to say, you know, Corey or Campo, I got no idea what I'm doing here. You know, can you help me out? You know, and things. And and so I always call it going to going to people a lot smarter than I am about this stuff. And and uh, um, and so you know, I think I think. I think that's that's where you develop the the coaching eye and the different things is 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 and you know one one thing people I don't think do enough of when, when I was your guys's age and coming up through I spent a lot of time going around watching other coaches and talking to them you know I'd go to their gyms and stuff and and I, I, don't, I don't think that that's done much anymore it's uh, done online now Rufus okay well we just we you just stare at your phone and watch on it via instagram <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> yeah but, i mean i it's a it sucks because then you lose it i mean if you i if you had an instagram rufus where you were posting stuff i'd i'd definitely follow and i'd give you likes and comments and all that stuff well, maybe but I'll you <laughs> if i can ever figure out how to post something on it there you go but you you do lose like you know, if I'm hanging out on a Saturday in the gym with you for three hours, that is nowhere close to the same thing as like, oh, he posted a two second Instagram clip from this one angle and he gave me four sentences about what he was seeing. Right. Like it's 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 just not even close to creating the same kind of experience for for any of those coaches. Right. You're uh, muted. Yeah, no, now I'm now I'm going. Um, no, I th I I think you're exactly right, and I think we we've lost that. Um, uh, I don't, I don't see many people doing that, you know, much anymore. And I, I you know it may be going on, and I just don't know it. You know, maybe I'm just out of the loop so far that, you know, but um, uh, you know, it 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 would be a treat for me, you know, if you guys were closer. You know, just come and just watch you guys work someday. I mean, even even if even if it's even if it's physical therapy, it's still knowledge that I could gain and insight into what I need to be doing. You know, Corey, Corey and I talk all the time, and you know, I've been lucky enough to you know that he stays in contact with me and stuff, and and um. You know, I can't tell you how many hours he spent trying to teach me different things, and and uh, um, and and some of it, you know, I've learned, and some of it's just way above my head. But um, but but so and and you know, he Corey's smart enough. He told me one time. He said, "You don't have to know everything I know." Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense, and it, it, I, I understand that a lot better, right? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, stay in your lane. Basically, is what he was telling me. Well, but you've always also, I mean, it comes down to like, what do you need to accomplish, right? Like, if I really wanted to learn all there is about motor learning, I'd have to go and take like calculus classes and learn like advanced probability and crap like that. Like, do I need to go and learn that right now? Or is my efforts better spent somewhere else? Am I, am I getting the job done well enough without knowing advanced level calculus? Like, yeah, probably. So it's like, all right, maybe we can, maybe we can learn something else right now. You know what I mean? And I think you've been very effective at what you've been doing for a long time too. So. Yeah. I think a lot of my development has come from just like, I'll watch Rufus coach like for a couple hours or like he may program this exercise and I'll watch him coach it this way. And I'll be like, Oh, I can think of three people that I may be able to use this for. So let me go in to work that next day and give those three people that exercise. I'm going to mess it up like 16 times trying to do it like he did at first and figure out what works. And you just keep going through that process. And eventually you just like, you say the 
the right cue faster over time and the process just continues to iterate. But it requires you to have to continue to make mistakes and say the wrong things to eventually get to the right thing. And like, yeah, that, oh, sorry, I, was, I think a huge piece that people don't always have the opportunity to do is to like go to an internship where they can just like absorb it for a couple of months before they start to go off on their own because it becomes more difficult if you don't have those reference points initially. Sure. Yeah, I think the the points that you guys are making in terms of like you got to mess around and find out kind of thing. I think that's extremely important that honestly, I think a lot of people are kind of afraid to do. Um, uh, and I think this is also another, well, I don't know if it's a consequence of Instagram or social media, or if it just gets magnified because of this stuff, but people tend to only post the highlight reels on social media. And so they just think that like, oh, well, these people are naturally logically gifted and amazingly genius minded and oriented but what again what they're not seeing is like no i just screwed this up like 20 other times and then now we are finally figuring out like okay this is actually the exercise that i'm supposed to do with this person right so you need that that like kind of what rufus was saying that creativity and that exploration to to figure all that out and honestly going back to your first question to me Corey in terms of what I didn't like about that orthopedic setting, that time constraint seriously hinders my capacity to, to try and explore things, right? And as a, a younger practitioner who's still like trying to formulate the ways in which I'm trying to do things, like that, that time is extremely valuable to try and figure out, okay, how am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to do that? And I always, like, I wonder all the time, it's like, okay, well, if I wasn't in that kind of setting and then more of this setting, would I have, would I have gotten to where I'm at right now faster if I had the, the opportunity for exploration? I don't know, but I'm here now, so it doesn't matter. Well, I think, you know, that's, I think that one of the problems is we don't have a apprenticeship program. You know, so where you go in, you know, I look at my years at, at IFAST and being around all you guys that I was around, it's like an apprenticeship for 10, 10 or 12 years, whatever it was, whatever the number was. You know, there was Ty, there was you, there was Corey, there was, you know, uh, uh, all, all these other people that I met and got to watch, you know, and got to talk to and things like that. And it, one of and one, one, for most of my career, I've had to work by myself. And you, I think I, I got bored. You know, if I haven't got somebody to bounce ideas off of, I get bored. For sure. Right. And so, and I lose my creativity. Well, here, here I am, in, here I am for all these years that I fast in, in, uh, in this creative environment where I could ask questions and, you know, some of them were dumb questions. And, but everybody took the time to answer it and you could bounce stuff off of each other, right? And, and I don't know is that we, we really do that anymore, you know? So, so, you know, how, how many guys coaching in college strength conditioning or even physical therapy went through an apprenticeship where they had to teach little kids how to do this stuff that aren't that can't do it because they're not coordinated or not prepared, you know, or whatever. Right. And I just use that as an example. And in in my world anyway. And but they go right to working with top level athletes. Well, dealing with the top level athlete is a whole lot different than dealing with, you know, uh, a, a kid where you got to be a lot more creative, I think. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and and they're not um, um, uh, you know, you, you get, you get, um, not spoiled, but you get a, you get a, uh, uh, a different, a different view of things because some of these guys, no matter what you do with them works just because right. they're so talented. Right. And, and the, the th thing you got to worry about is just don't screw them up. Right. 
I could have coached Michael Jordan only because don't screw him up, right? No matter what you do with him, just don't screw him up. And and so uh, I think um get, going off that the so I agree with you where with kids you have to be extremely uh, much more creative in terms of like what is the kind of exercise you have to do with this kid in order to help them understand exactly what you're trying to do with them right with um with the top level athletes that and so especially when we're going through like our if I've got a bunch of the basketball players in or if we've got baseball players in but I almost look so good at my job because I'm able to give them an exercise or give them a kind of activity and we get this awesome change and I have to say two words and they already pick it up and I'm able to give them like it's honestly sloppy coaching where I can give them like three or four cues at once. I'm like slapping myself on the wrist for doing that. But then I turn around and they're actually doing all four of those things at once. I'm like, Oh, okay. That's not, that's not usually how it's supposed to happen, but all right, that's fine. Yeah, the, um, the, the level of athleticism is better. Therefore they can, they can do more things, right? They're just naturally. For sure. Right? For sure. So yeah. And their, their feel for their body and like, I can give it, it's not going to be a very good cue. It'll be vague and they'll pick it up. No problem. Right. So it's, there's more margin for error in terms of how you might coach them, but to, to the point of like, just don't screw them up. I think a lot of people, um, the hard part with them, I think is recognizing, uh, in terms of their body, like what makes them special at what they're doing. And then, how do you not screw that up? Because it, it's easier said than done to like take a take a Michael Jordan and screw him up or not screw him up, right? No, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. So but that that's also part of where like the you know the you got to find where those boundary lines with that person are, but then as soon as you identify those things, everything that you can do within those boundaries is like almost endless, right? Versus the kid, it's like their boundaries are all the way around here. It's just a matter of like making sense of all the stuff in the middle of it. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Have you just working with a bunch of different types of athletes? Have you noticed like, whether it's like position based or sport based, there's like certain trends that say make a guard in basketball good or a pitcher good or a catcher good. Like, are there certain kind of patterns you've noticed? I mean, it's going to be somewhat individual. But generally speaking, yeah. Uh, take take your pick on which sport and position you want to talk about. Let's go Let's talk some basketball. Okay. So over the past, and I'm not going to talk like I'm a seasoned expert or anything, but over the past two seasons, uh, two and a half, I'd say, three years ago, I had a little bit of experience with some basketball guys. Um, the the height component that they have as well as how their body starts to learn how to deal with that height component starts to become very telling to me so let's take um uh, let's like really exaggerate so let's take a guy who's like 610 611 right so because of how tall he is, it makes it extremely difficult for him to control his center of gravity, okay? And so what they tend to do is they take, like, their shoulders, their upper rib cage, and their head, and they compress it all together, squeeze it all together, so that they can push much more straight down into the ground. And that enables them to demonstrate a little bit more hip internal rotation as opposed to if they got pushed way forward that's what i've started to notice with a few guys so instead of trying to push their center of gravity forward they push it as much as they can straight down um, more towards like the ball of their foot as opposed to way outside their center of gravity as if they're going to start to fall forward i think that's where they start to get in trouble is when it gets way too far forward away from them as opposed to straight down where it's still forward because their sport is 
forward and in front of them, but it's straight down towards like the balls of their feet. So that enables them to still stay athletic and stay moderately under control um, while still um, uh, staying faster. If, if, if that so, makes any sense to you guys. So is, is that fixable or changeable? Would it, would it be better for them to be able to get pushed forward a little bit? Would it be, would it make them better able to move a little bit better? If they're so it, a little push forward or so to handle that pushing forward? Again, that that's going to be situational, right? So if I, I had honestly, one of the first basketball guys I worked with, he was way too far forward to the point where, when he would shoot a basketball, he had to take his left hand and put it on the front of the basketball in order to help to keep his center of gravity pushed back to load up for the shot and then and then take the shot, right? That's too far forward. So from a skill standpoint and from a from a bodily injury standpoint, he started to have issues in both of those regards. And so through some of the work that we did, we were able to improve how his body felt as well as improve his capacity to get into these positions for to get his shot off, right? Versus other guys who, you know, I, I've got a, a he's like a seven footer I just started working with. He has to seriously control that center of gravity, but he's really good at pushing it straight down. But that limits uh, how much hip and shoulder range of motion that he's able to to demonstrate. So if I, and so this is, again, this is the science experiment that we get to play around with right now is his hips and his shoulders and his neck hurt. Okay. Well, he's probably not going to play very well. If all of that stuff is always nagging at him, he can tell me how tough he is and everything like that, but you're probably going to play better. If some of that stuff feels better as opposed to not. However, if I take too much of that away from him, is that now going to disrupt how well he can potentially manage his rather high center of gravity? That, that, that's the experiment that we get to run this offseason. That's, 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 in, that's interesting. So, so going back to what we were just talking about, I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that if you're in a very strict setting like you were in or if you're working by yourself or when I was working by myself, you know, it, 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 you would get bored because there's nobody to talk this out with. And, you know, I'm assuming you and Mike K work pretty close together. So you got, you know, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And you discuss it back and forth. And and uh, um, and that's or, or having somebody to call up, you know, like you or Corey. <clears throat> excuse me and uh um and 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 talk these things out and and i think i think that's that's how that's how you learn and then like you said just go just go in and experiment with it you know and see what happens you know if you don't like the result you're getting then change it you know for, yeah. for someone that size what does pushing into the ground offer them as opposed to someone who might be like you know five foot ten and at the same time the based on the strategy they're using of like, I guess, just pushing like shoulders down, head down. Like, what does that also take away? Well, it take, takes its height away. I mean, I've genuinely made, I, I kind of joke with them where I, I tell them, hey, how tall are you? Okay, I'm going to make you two inches taller right now as I'm like pulling on their head or something like that. It's a way to like break the ice. But at the end of the day, like, I'm honestly expecting them to get off of the table and, and feel taller, right? Um, in terms of how much a seven footer has to do that versus a, a someone who's 5'10", it just depends on, on degree. So how hard does that seven footer have to push down into the ground um, compared to the individual who's 5'10", just to, just to manage gravity, right? The person who's seven feet tall is going to have to do that a lot harder to the extent where I'm sweating trying to pull a scap off of the back of their rib cage to reduce some of that push versus maybe someone who's five foot ten. I'm not trying all that hard. And and that depends on activity as well. So if you're 
if you're a high competitive level power lifter, the extent you have to push into the ground is going to be greater than someone who uh, just sits at a desk all day or whatever. Time, how long has this person been functioning like this? That also plays a massive role into it as well. So I kind of gauge all of that. So, you know, if I'm working in a post-op clinic and it's more um, older folks, I kind of have an idea of, you know, that's more of a longevity of like how long have you been doing this kind of thing versus someone who's 22. It's probably not going to be as drastic or as extreme of a strategy, right? So. So how, how does, go, go, go ahead, ahead, Rufus. No, um, along those lines. So how does that affect his play if if he pushes too much in the, in the floor and you don't want him to push so much into the floor am i re am i saying that right um i think the way that he's been doing it has been good enough to help him out uh so far obviously he's had a, had a great career and has seen success so he's it's been working for him it's just a matter of what are you giving up in order to have that kind of have that kind of strategy? Can you explain that a little more? Like I'm assuming you're talking about some type of potential, just like I don't know, you call it anterior chest compression, rounded shoulders type of anterior yeah, so, orientation where your pelvis so he's is got, driving down. He's got some of that. Take um take the back of someone's head and pull it. Uh, imagine. Imagine you have a top hat on, okay? And grab onto the sides of the top hat and pull straight down so that you're pulling yourself down into the balls of your feet. That's more of the strategy that he was kind of demonstrating. So it's a, it's a compressive, it's literally, I'm trying to go straight down type of strategy as opposed to that a push forward can still be a compressive strategy, but it, it just depends on the direction of where that push is necessarily going. Is it going, is it going at this kind of angle down? Is it going at that kind of angle down? Is it going at that angle forward? Right. So, so yeah, does that help? Yeah. So if you start to take too much of that away from them, like what, what does that mean in terms of just how they're going to like what in terms of their more performance measures, right? Like, are we under operating under the assumption that part of that is what has made them successful up to this point? Uh, yes. Yeah, so overall, overall force production into the ground. Um, so let's say, you know, he's, he's not the only seven footer around. There's other big men on the basketball court. And someone's trying to move me out from underneath the basket. How hard do you have to push into the ground in order to make sure that they don't move? Can you push hard enough with just your leg? Okay, do you need to start to use your pelvis? Do you need to start to use your lower back? Do you need to start to use your shoulders? Do you need to start to use your head? Like how, how again, how hard do you have to push? And if I take too much of that away from him, is that going to be of detriment? Is he not going to be as as powerful into the ground as he was otherwise? And and sometimes you can take that away from them and they can still generate the same amount of force elsewhere. Other times you can't, right? This was um, I think like a an obvious example of this is baseball. So like a baseball pitcher is always going to demonstrate an exaggerated amount of shoulder external rotation people would call that a compensation. They have to do that for their sport. So is, is that a compensation at that point, if they have to do it? If I take all of that exaggerated external orientation away from them, um, or if I expect it to never come back, then that would, that would kind of be short-sighted of me, right? I think they're always going to end up using these strategies. It's just a matter of, can I give them uh, activities 
to pull the reins in a little bit to make sure that it's not um, it's not being mismanaged in any way. And this kind of goes back to our <clears throat> earlier points too, of like you can have this cookie cutter approach or this like optimal idea for movement. When you're working with these athletes, they're coming in with a certain body type, certain structure and certain demands of their sport. So you don't want to start to bring them more toward that quote unquote optimal if it's going to take away what has made them successful. I think which is a lot of what you're getting at here. Yeah, there, there's no such thing as optimal. It's understanding how they've been doing things a certain way and is is that working for them and is it um is it viable for the long term for some guys it is and for others it's it's not so they need people again to help them manage what they have going on so again i told this guy i'm like i i don't think you're planning on getting shorter anytime soon so a lot of this stuff is probably going to come back. So I need to set that expectation for him of like, yeah, you feel good right now, but the way you play and how your body is structured, how you, what you have to do for your sport necessitates you to create this kind of force into the ground. And in order for you to do that, this is how you've been doing it. Can we potentially train him to do it some way else? Maybe. Again, I don't know what the ceiling is for that because if I have another seven foot, 280 pound human being pushing against me, I'm probably going to use every fiber of my being to push back against him because he's doing the same exact thing to me, right? How, what's the extent that we can train them to do that otherwise? I, I don't know. And I don't know how useful that would be. I don't know how long that would take, right? Those are experiential questions that I just don't have the answers for. Well, so for someone who might be new to working with a specific um, like type of athlete or a specific just sport in general, like what are some ways you're thinking about things more like generally or principles based in terms of like how, like I have a basketball player here. I'm not going to treat them like a, a marathon runner or like what are the demands of the sport kind of things along those lines? The, specifically for basketball or just like just more generally like more of a framework for i'm working with x, x type of sport or the x type of position like here's yeah, kind of the things i need to think about i, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head and so it's what what is their sport asking of them and then another step from that depending on the level at which you're working at so if you're working with a kid what's the demands of the sport are they up to snuff to meeting those demands? Okay, let's just train those because they don't they don't even have the capacity for those demands yet. Maybe a, a higher level high school athlete or a college level athlete already has been demonstrating that, yeah, I, I got the stuff. I can do this. Okay. How have you been doing it? What how have you been actually reaching those demands? And now the the management piece starts to come into it. It's like, okay, are we? is this starting to become interference towards elbow range of motion for, for a baseball pitcher, right? Is there a more efficient way that you can be doing something the same way? And then now that you do have those demands, are you able to maintain them? Are there other certain low hanging fruit that we can continue to, to work upon, right? To, to Rufus's, quote about Michael Jordan like if you're getting Michael Jordan in, in his prime it's just like okay just figure out what he's really good at and make sure you just maintain those and then that that's literally the program right make sure he doesn't really deviate too much from everything else and then he should be good to go for for a high school level athlete well he's he's again he's never really achieved or attained any of those things so the let the sport kind of guide you in terms of like what does he need the the capacity for or she what do they need the capacity for in order to enable them to to compete right and so then that's at the end of the day that's really like the the general guiding principle for anyone you're working with right and that's going to depend on the demands of the sport as in like a pitcher is going to have very different demands than a midfielder in soccer 
So like you sure. kind of have to, you have to understand what those demands are and how you're going to address things from a programming standpoint in terms of getting them to meet those demands. Correct. Sure. I don't, I don't, I don't care one iota. Uh, I shouldn't say that because they do throw the ball in in soccer, like maybe once or twice a game, but I really don't care about the elastic capacity of a soccer player's upper body other than just like using their arm swing to help them sprint. But even then, like if you've seen a lot of like soccer players sprint, they don't really use their arms a whole lot just because they're always focused on the ground and they need to make a sudden change of direction. So they're not going to run like an actual high level sprinter. Right. But again, it's like, okay, the demand of baseball requires this kind of, and especially a pitcher requires this kind of, characteristic of their throwing arm okay i'm not going to do the same kind of program i would for a soccer player maybe their conditioning might look a little similar at some points in the program just because there are repeat sprint efforts in each sport but not again not to the same extent so uh, anything you want to add rufus Man, my head is about to explode from listening to all this. Um, if you don't, know how you lost all your hair, Rufus? <laughs> That's kind of you know. I had a full head of hair when I first went to IFAST, and then uh, <laughs> kind of fell out after meeting all you guys. You know, and and, uh, and that's how, that's what that's actually what happened to Corey's hair. It, yeah. it just is actually starting to go white now. So oh, it's from all the stress. Yeah, it's yeah just slowly go. losing more color. I don't even need the chemicals. I, I think it's Corey's fantasy of becoming a WWE wrestler. <laughs> hey, well, he's got to follow in your footsteps. Oh, he's got you've, been, he's, you've been brainwashing me this whole time. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> I do. I do have a question, or or if Corey's done on this topic, that I want to talk yeah. about rotational athletes. Okay, and. Um, Pitchers, basketball players, you know, change the direction guys, you know, okay. and, and things like that. Um, uh, for, first of all, uh, how, as a strength coach, do you identify the guy doesn't rotate very well or can't go to his left or right very well? What, what sport are we talking about? Um, oh, 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 yeah. Okay. Let, let's say a baseball pitcher. Okay. Um, uh, you know, how, how do you tell that when he throws, he doesn't rotate very well? I mean, what are, what are some, some easy things that I can pick out that say, okay, you know, you're, you're not, you know, look at this and you know, you're not, you're, you're forcing the rotation instead of it turning natural. So I'm going to, Feel free. I'm, going to, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to do it with a disclaimer, okay? Because you're looking for general guidelines of like what to what to look for for everyone, and I have to say that everyone is going to be a little bit different, right? Right, but but still, I think isn't isn't there some general things that you look at that that I can see? And then kind of take it down into, you know, what else you look at and things like yep. that. So kind of what I'm trying to do is, is in the next few minutes, get a complete course on this rotation. <laughs> How about this? I'll break it down from like section to section or from point to point with each pitch. And I'll try to think of a few things off the top of my head. Right. And again, like there, there's innumerable things right. to, no, to I, see and to pick out for, right? I understand that. And some of them is way out of my wheelhouse to try to fix, right? So so when um, when I'm watching a leg lift, so a pitcher is set, and then he lifts his lead leg, I'll watch his back foot and his back leg. And if I see that bottom heel kind of turn out, away from the rubber uh if i see the knee kind of turn out too much and if i see the whole body kind of turn towards second base too much 
that is a good indicator to me that they are starting to miss uh, some internal rotation somewhere in their in their system on that side. And so they now have to create this uh, excessive movement to create the rotation in order to get into that position. Does that make sense? Well, that makes a whole lot of sense. Okay. And, and so that, you know, that that's something that, you know, I can see, okay, there's a problem here, right? Or, or there could be a problem. Potential. But right. so that kind of, that sets the cascade for the majority of their, their wind up as they go down the mound. So now if I already have uh, this kind of orientation towards second, if I'm a right-handed pitcher, if I have this orientation towards third base or towards second base, now as I start to move down the mound and travel down the mound uh, in, in pitching language or in pitching coach lingo, they would call this like getting stuck on their backside. So they've kind of turned too much towards second or towards third base. And so now as they start to rotate back down towards home plate, they almost over, they call it like flying open. So they like yank their glove to help them turn and then their arm flies open and then they actually aren't as um, consistent with throwing strikes because of that, okay? So those would be like the main things uh, from like a, leg lift to traveling down the mound. I call that hand separation. So that's when like the hand starts to leave the glove. When the front foot hits the mound, some, or yeah, hits the, the mound. Now we're talking about the, the left side of their body. A few things I look for is that the, the hips and the torso are square to home plate when they're uh, achieving maximum layback of their shoulder. And that's cluing me into where they're potentially elastically loading their throwing arm. So if they're not fully turned towards home plate, the, the twist through their body is probably going to be a little bit more proximal Maybe it's through their shoulder girdle, maybe it's through their neck, maybe it's through their rib cage, but it's not all the way out to the arm. Versus if they're too far rotated, it might be too far out on their arm. And then I'm also looking at the lead hip. So is the lead hip starting to come back towards me if I'm watching them from the back? And then I'm also looking at like their lower back and their, their left rib cage. Are they starting to kind of side bend? as they get to lay back and their release, or is that side actually able to come back towards me? Th those are like key signs of whether or not they're able to, to fully how much, demonstrate how much, rotation. How much side bend are you allowing then? That's a, that's a very, it depends kind of question there, Rufus. Okay. Cause, because they, you know, guys tell me all the time, well, you know, the side bends okay. And it's like, it's like they're almost leaning over you know, or it looks like it to me, but when they're, when they're foot, when they're foot plants, the, the knee will go out towards the dugout on the left side or the foot will go out towards that left side. And I don't know enough about pitching to get in a big argument about this, but it, it just seems to me that's, that's not what you want. There's you're, you're getting, you're getting the rotation you want, but you're getting it from somewhere else. Right. Then, yeah. Then, right. So so now we're now we're having an argument about efficiency. Yeah. And 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 about control and about command. So if I'm if I'm seeing that kind of action at the lead leg, I would imagine that a lot of guys are starting to to either push the baseball or not have the same kind of elastic load through their arm as they otherwise would. It's a lot more effortful of a throw as opposed to a lot of guys will say like, it feels like it's flying out of my hand. Like it's an effortless 90 mile an hour fastball versus an effortful 88 mile an hour fastball. All right. Okay. That, um, that, 
So if you if you're orienting that far out into external rotation on that lead leg, again, some some guys can pull it off. So um, who's the pitcher for the Braves? Um, are you a Braves fan, Rufus, or not really? I don't follow baseball that much. Okay, so go. I'm gonna have you go on YouTube. Um, his name is Spencer Strider. He's like the ace pitcher for the Braves right now. And he's got uh, tree trunk quads that a running back in the NFL would be jealous of. Okay. And so this is honestly a really cool uh, individual characteristic of how, how he throws. So he's able to plant his left leg and it starts to orient out. And then that wave of energy starts to hit his quad and you almost see that quad like catch it and bring it back into the rest of his body and then put it back into his throwing arm. It's on, it's one of the cooler things to, to watch in baseball for me right now. So he has this like crazy muscular adaptation of, you know, tree trunk quads and that's enabling him to create that much of an orientation on his lead leg, but still recapture that energy and put it into a baseball to help to command it and spin it how he wants to. And he throws it like eight miles mustache. an hour. Yes. Yep. He's got a sweet mustache too. Yeah, he does. This would actually be a pretty good view. So he's using that back quad, so he loads the crap out of it, which some coaches would be against, right? But for me, well, his, you can kind of see. So play it back for me. His The batter's head is blocking his knee, but you can still see his shin kind of move out. So right, right there, you see how his knee's moving way out, and then whomp, it comes all the way back in. Yeah, but look where it winds up, right? Exactly. So his, so his, his knee – is over over his toe basically yeah it goes out it goes out over like his pinky toe and then it he extends the crap out of his knee essentially to finish it but that's just his quad trying to there it goes so you, you see like his quad like push his femur back into his pelvis yeah and then it redirects all that energy that right at the same time he's hitting uh essentially max p at his shoulder where he gets full layback and then that catapults his arm forward i see like when he pushes that that femur into the left hip his right hip almost rides up and it shoots back into the right is that kind of what's happening there yeah that that's how much energy that his leg is generating it's pushing literally his whole body in that direction but it's still re reorienting it some of it towards his right shoulder so now so now this is an efficiency standpoint like he obviously is generating a crap ton of force with that leg it's moving the that wave of energy from his leg you saw is moving his entire body can we potentially and again i'm, I'm not his trainer i'm not gonna armchair coach him or anything like that but i would want to see is i don't necessarily want to take that away from him but can we generate uh, or direct rather more of that energy towards his arm and his shoulder as a port, as opposed to towards the rest of his body. Can, does he, can he tolerate that amount of energy going to his shoulder? Yeah. I, I don't know that those are the, those are the questions that we need to answer if I'm working with him as opposed to watching him from the row 10 on, on the field. Right. So this goes back to a lot of talking about earlier of like, you know, maybe we can improve his shoulder external rotation or we can improve some other movement or rehab KPI. But like because of just the timing and coordinated nature of the that pitching motion, like who's to say it's actually going to make a difference when he's doing his like when he's throwing. For sure. So that's um that that's where I don't uh dip my toes into. That's more of like a coaching realm. Where, where I see myself influencing pitchers is I essentially give them these tools. So it's, um, it's, it's just self-organization. So if I, if I open a different avenue for energy to go into and I close another avenue for energy to go into, it's just following the path of least resistance. I think he has a feel for being able to change and modify some of those things, but I don't think he's totally in control of it 
in the moment, right? It's just happening too fast. So now if I can change some of the, some of those pressure gradients through his body to almost like funnel it and redirect it where we want it to go. And he doesn't have to think about anything like that. I just need him to think about how he's doing a split squat or how he's doing a med ball throw. Can we then potentially influence that efficiency in terms of that, where that path of energy is moving through his body, right? That that's where I try to, to make my impact. I'm not going to talk to guys about like, yeah, time your, time your back arm with your lead leg and blah, blah, blah. Like that's, that, that's not my wheelhouse. I'm not a pitching coach. I'm not going to try and do that. Right. My, my role is how can I work behind the curtains and, you know, pull some puppet strings, so to speak, to try to make things a, a slightly more efficient. Did that improve their performance? Did that not improve their performance? Yes. No, maybe so. You, you got to try, you got to mess around. So and when you say- when when you say energy are you you're referring to like energy going through the system as a result of the the body position and then just the force demands that they're experiencing and how that's all coordinating together correct correct so the 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 elastic the capacity for certain things to absorb energy will influence that the pressure gradients in their body and how then that correlates to range of motions is what's cluing me into that as well. Um, yeah. So you're so. just influencing that with your interventions and then just, Hey, go throw and let's just see how, whatever we did just change how that transmits through the system. Correct. And then if I have a, if I have a pitching coach next to me, I'm telling them, this is what I see. This is what I'm trying to do. Do you agree with this? Is there some sort of like coaching cue that you've been using with them to help facilitate that a little bit more? But again, it's like, I don't, that, that's where my, that's where my job ends and theirs begins. So if you have a basketball player with a partial Achilles tear and a calcaneus that has changed shape into supination, you have changed a constraint so that the energy can't go through the system the way you want when they go to push out of that cut. Just to Hence kind of why I'm taping circle. her foot. Hence why I'm taping her foot. And I'm doing interventions to try and increase the, the relative stiffness of whatever is left so that the energy doesn't essentially um, create an eddy. So like if you're watching like a river, it doesn't just kind of stop the water doesn't just stop in one place. It continues to flow. I don't want to create an eddy. I don't want to create a, a delay where I don't want there to be a delay in motion, right? I want that to continue to, to work through that system. I don't want energy to accumulate at, at, um, at damaged tissue. That's like the opposite of what I want. So then if we bring it back to the pitcher example, like these are, these are high forces and high energy demands. So if you, you don't want to transmit it, you don't want to make a change where it could potentially transmit it to an area that's not ready to handle that type of energy demand. Hence why I wonder if spent, if we took all the energy that Spencer Strider's quad is deflecting into the rest of his body how much of that would he be able to tolerate if we channeled a, like ten uh, percent more of that into his arm? I don't know. He's maybe been. Maybe we don't. Maybe we don't want to know. Well, again, he's from what I've observed about him throwing. He tends to come out really hot in the early innings, so he'll be like ninety-eight, ninety-nine in the early innings, and then in the later innings, he drops it all the way down to like. 94 95 again i i this is all pure speculation okay i don't know if the coaching staff is telling him to kind of pump the brakes a little bit i don't know if he has some sort of like prior injury history that is that is encouraging them to tell him to pump the brakes i i genuinely do not know but that's obviously something that we would want to to take into consideration and i would try to make sure that okay is the is the shoulder in a place where it can actually absorb some of that energy. So let's say like he's got no right shoulder internal rotation. So the front of his right chest doesn't really expand all that well. 
but I'm about to take a whole left quads worth of energy and shove it straight up towards in that direction, but it doesn't have anywhere to go. Okay. That's probably a, that that's probably where I wouldn't want to gener, uh, direct the energy right now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's what we want, but if I can, if he, if I were to ever work with him and he walks in and he's got 30 degrees of right, of right shoulder IR and I change that to, I don't know, 50. Then we can redirect the energy from his left leg, you know, angle it just a little bit more up towards his right shoulder. And he's in a better spot. Okay, maybe, maybe now we can give it a shot. Again, how much more of that do we want to push in there? So, so this is something you're, oh, this is when you say like, it's like your experiment of your taking these things into consideration, making the change and seeing the response in terms of how things are transmitting once you're, they're actually doing the, the task. For sure. And, and I'm, I'm having these conversations with, with athletes, right? Um, it's not like I'm totally leaving them in the dark about this stuff. Cause like, again, to, to use this hypothetical situation, like if I'm saying to him, I'm going to direct more of this energy into your arm and that can help you seamlessly throw a little bit faster, a little bit easier for longer, but it's a ton of energy that we want to make sure that your arm is capable of dealing with. And we're just not going to know until we try it. It is his, again, like as a healthcare practitioner, it is his ultimate decision. It's the patient or the client's ultimate decision to pull the trigger on an intervention. It's not up to me. That, that would honestly be rather selfish of me to just like, Ooh, what if, you know, what if I did this to him, right? Like that's not, that's not up for, up for debate. Now, some people will do certain things without the understanding of the potential consequences of it. That's also kind of, um, uh, what, what would the word be? Na naive, I guess you could say, but it'd be like naive with, you know, potential negative consequences. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make changes to, to a guy, I wanna understand like, okay, what are, the, what are the positives, potential positives, and what are the potential negatives? while still understanding that there might be some other stuff that I just haven't, haven't foreseen. Right. But as long as you're telling them that, then again, like the, if, if they're on board for it and they're demonstrating autonomy in terms of like, yeah, I want to do that. Okay. Let's do it. Right. So is that, is that something that is, I know it's individual individual, but is that something you would be more forceful with? in telling them to implement if they're younger than than like that guy right there i mean yeah like he he's gonna have a great career in the mlb regardless of if we change anything or not right and then it depends on the on the goal of the younger individual okay yeah. are they trying are they trying to go for broke for their playing career okay if if you, that's what you really want it's not going to be an easy nor safe road. But if they're coming to me and they're telling me that they just want to enjoy their sport, okay, I'm probably not, I'm going to be a lot less, uh, probably going to be more risk averse with that person, right? I'm not going to take, take these crazy chances that are going to potentially blow out ligaments and stuff like that. So. Oh, what, so what, what kind of, if you were training this guy, for example, mm -hmm. okay, what kinds of things would you do to improve his rotation? Um, by improve rotation, I'm going to say that I'm trying to direct more of that energy towards his shoulder, right? So I need to pull pull the video up again do you have it rufus i was kind of hinting at this a little bit but what what you'd want to try and do so this is where like the constraints of everything you know how people talk about like a constraint based approach like i'm looking at the body as the constraint and i'm just trying to funnel where the energy is trying to go so if I see all that energy going out into the side of his right hip, 
that's telling me that that right hip is oriented more towards external rotation. So he's probably missing some, some right hip extension on the table. I would want to try interventions to increase the amount of right hip extension that he would demonstrate, as well as the amount of right shoulder internal rotation that he would demonstrate. So that's funneling the energy away from his right hip and up towards the front of his right shoulder. And then again, it's like I'm trying to, you see where he blorps over to the right with his right hip, right? So I want to create a little bit more of a wall, a little bit more pressure there to fight against that left quad. And then I'm creating a path of least resistance. So I'm going to create a little bit more expansion in the front of his right chest. And that's going to continue to funnel that up in that direction. And then we might change his programming a little bit to where maybe we're trying to create a little bit more like vertical force production, uh, especially with the lead leg. Because if it's shooting out laterally over to the right, I want to direct it up and to the right a little bit more. So we're just kind of, again, we're just changing like where I'm trying to shoot this energy through his body. Is, he, is his shape in a position to where like, yeah, it's probably going to go in that direction. And then can I now aim the cannon of his left leg to shoot it in that direction? What, what kind of exercises would that look like? So the left leg shoots or the femur on the left shoots back into the left hip and kicks it out to the right. But because the right side is in more, is biased more toward external rotation, instead of like there being, I guess you could call it like that, like tension or block on that right side, the whole extremity and hip just turns out and yeah, kicks so out. And Rufus, then can you bring, bring the video back up and pause it right when you see his right hip start to push out to the side. See if your video expertise can do that. Pressure's on. Oh, yeah. Right there. Nope. Hold it back. Right there. Yeah. Okay. What? What's his uh, right ilium look like right there? His right ilium? Yeah. Um, it's an ER position, like where or which way is it facing? Yeah, I mean, you, well, you, it's like it's it, it's trying to turn left, but it's but the force they're taking it to the right and it's biased toward ER. Okay, so then there we go, and you can see like his ASIS and everything poking out of the side of his pants, right? Ah, uh, okay, I, yeah, I see that now. Like it's so, literally all the energy is hmm. smacking into the side of his hip and it's and just pushing it, it into that direction. So we can maintain more hip internal rotation, get that ASIS more facing to the left. Yep. Yeah, I'm taking I'm taking the whole ilium and I'm turning it to to catch all that energy and deflect it up and back up to his shoulder, right? Playing pong. I'm just playing pong with the energy coming from his left foot. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing with his left quad. If he didn't have that beefy left quad, it would continue to spin out and away towards the second baseman. But instead, that the that massive quad like catches everything and turns it and pushes it back into the rest of his body. And you're never going to take that away from him unless you know you have him lay in a hospital bed for months on end. And I would never wish that upon him or anything like that. But you'd have to like significantly atrophy his lower half to take that kind of that kind of um, uh, behavior, that movement behavior away from the guy. That that's literally what makes him who he is, right? So when you're looking at something like this, are you like you describe sort of sections and just um, points through the pitching motion? Uh -huh. Are you just in terms of what what they need to do are you just kind of figuring out what what sticks out the most in your head from what you're seeing and then going from there are like you, in terms are you saying in terms of like what quote unquote makes them special kind of thing more in terms of like you're picking up like you're picking up a big thing with that right hip that you would want to address to direct things up more toward the shoulder okay but we could have probably watched his like pitching motion a couple more times and picked out like 
X amount of things that we could potentially change. Maybe. So are you just kind of like, look based on your experience picking out what sticks out the most in your head based on what you would like it to look like okay so so stay on this picture do you see how his his jaw and his ear on the right yeah. side are also pushing out in that direction i was just about to say that yeah okay so like what do you think is going to make a bigger difference for him changing his right hip ir or changing whether or not his jaw can move to the left probably the hip okay why why would you say that um well just in terms of well just one we see it immediately kick out to the right when the, when the left femur goes back okay and two just pure size Okay. And just how three, just how the wave is going to travel through the system and the energy is going to have to dissipate somewhat as it goes through. So, right. like, so there's probably a lot more energy going through that one so, area so, at that point in time. So where, where's more movement occurring at the hip and pelvis or at the jaw? Probably the hip. Okay. So where's their potential, more potential for energy? At the hip. Okay. Can can you back squat more or can you bench press with your jaw more? What, what, how much more weight can you do with either one, right? Uh, I'd hope back squat a lot more. Yeah, same, right? So unless, unless it's – I'm not saying you shouldn't try to necessarily influence the jaw because, all right, maybe if we got his neck to turn over to the left a little bit more, that would pull his shoulder into a little bit more IR – and he'd demonstrate a little bit more of that pump handle. It might still be useful, but again, like if I'm seeing that drastic of a movement through his right hip, that's mm -hmm. a lot more energy moving in that direction than potentially where his where his jaw and his ear are going, right? So so isn't the isn't the hip influencing the jaw? Or the yes. Jaw? Yeah. So so now again, it's like Okay, so now we're track now we're just tracking a bunch of different KPIs. So if I if I change the right hip IR or excuse me, the right hip extension, and I can turn that ilium in, into a little bit more IR at the point of impact, does that change his right shoulder internal rotation? Does that change his, his cervical rotation? If that's the case, and I just I mean, I just have to worry about the right hip IR and I know the others will follow. That's how I start to cross off measurements that I need to give a shit about, or excuse me, care about. I just need to look at right hip extension. And I know that we're going to pick up 20 more degrees of shoulder IR because of it. That's amazing. It's fun. <laughs> it's really fun. That's why I love my job. It's so much fun, dude. It, it's so, so you just put the cross, you just put the jigsaw puzzle together. Yeah. That's, and then, yeah, I'm, go ahead. Well, and so again, like maybe you get those changes and then maybe you don't. Now you know what the what the second step is. Okay, so first step was let's see if we can get him a little bit more right hip extension. Does that change his right shoulder? Does that change what it looks like when he throws? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay, then now the second piece of the jigsaw puzzle is we need to start doing this that and the other to his right shoulder and his and his neck okay boom now okay now i know what i need to try and do for his lower half now i know what i need to try and do for his upper half and then now i understand how i'm going to try and track these potential changes is is anything happening below his hip influ influencing what his hip is doing uh on the right side Yes. Potentially. I would need to see like uh footage from like the backside so I can see again whether his so if his right foot is really oriented out into external rotation, is that potentially influencing how that right hip is going to be situated as he's moving down the mound? That I don't know. Well, you might be able to see it from here. I think my hair is getting lighter the longer we have this conversation I'm trying to keep up i don't think he necessarily would well he might get like super oh, a little bit 
Oh, uh, so go um bring it back a little bit, Rufus. So he's gonna so hey Rufus, what is it? Um if you pause it, so actually I'm gonna show you a little cheat code. If you pause it and then you press the period key on your keyboard, it'll progress the YouTube video frame by frame. So you don't have to play this like whack-a-mole game of pressing the pause button. So pause it and then just hit the period key. Yeah, there you go. That is a very useful hack when trying to watch YouTube videos. That's for everyone. So you're going to see like a window of right when, keep going. Keep going a little bit more. Stop. One more. Right there. Okay. So do you see how the the top half of his shin and his ankle is going, or excuse me, the top half of his ankle, kind of where like the top of his cleat is and his black sock starting to head towards us, but his foot is staying planted on the mound yeah. so his so the top half of his foot is twisting into internal rotation but the back half is staying twisted into external rotation so it'd be like um i think if not... you keep i think if you keep playing it you'll actually see the foot spin out a little bit too keep going It? Ooh. Ooh. So if you hit the comma button, hit the comma button, it'll bring it back. Boom. Ooh. One more. Right there. Like that big toe starts to come off. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah, it yep. comes off and then he starts to orient it down. Okay. Yep. So so he twists his foot. So the top half of his ankle and his shin twists into IR. Then he twists it back into ER. Then he actually helps that. He, that twist helps to fling him down the mound. And that's pretty common in a lot of uh, right-handed, well, a lot of pitchers in general, but right-handed pitchers. Um, and so that can potentially create the external rotation bias that you see at the, at the right hip. So what we would potentially try to do, so now, okay, we see that at his right foot. Do I need to take, do I need to take this part of his foot and his bone? Because right and now it's, take it's the twisting video in that his... direction. Unshare it. So is... So his his hip his right hip is starting to push out, right? Yep. Is 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 that a result of where the left foot is landing? Because if you look at it, it it looks like he's almost rolling out on his on his right on his on his left foot a little bit because of where it's planted and he's trying to stay over it. So if he's like if he's stepping across his body, you're saying? Yeah, I or think just so. like how his how his left foot is positioned. So how his left foot is positioned. So so it's so, it's going to the it's going to the right, but it looks uh -huh. like he's trying to keep his his left hip and knee inside all that. Uh-huh. So so replay it back. Go like a, a couple frames back. Okay. I don't know why this thing's clicking on me. All right. Okay. So you see how, so take it all the way to like the very moment his foot, his left foot hits the dirt. Okay. Right. Okay. One more. One more. Boom. There. Okay. Okay. So if he didn't have a 
power lifter sized left quad. Right. And based on that foot position, where is all of his energy going to end up going? To the right. Yeah, it's going to go out. It's pretty much going to go out and away from his body. It's going to dissipate. Right. So, so look at look at his right leg. It's all going to the right. Mm -hmm. And if we go a little forward, it comes back in. And I'm wondering if that's why it's that that hip is getting shoved out. The right say, hip. Say that again. Say that again for me. So I'm wondering if. So right here, he starts, he starts bringing the left thigh and knee back in. Uh huh. Okay. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if that's what's shoving the right hip out so far is because of his where his foot is and what he's trying to do to bring his thigh back in. If that's not what's bringing his hip out to the side. That that is exactly what's bringing his his hip out to the side, Rufus. So if he if he turned his left foot in, so what make what again what makes him really good and what makes him really special is because all that energy from how he's placing his left foot should shoot out to the right. But because he's got this beefy quad, it can catch all that energy and push it back over to the right. That's shoving that right hip out like you're like you're describing, right? So, so it it should push him to the left, the left, not the right. Am I if, or am I missing? If he didn't, so if he didn't, if he kept his foot the way it is, and he yeah. didn't have a tree trunk of a leg, it would probably continue to go out to the right. Does that make sense? What would go out to the right? The, oh, yeah, missing the, that piece. The energy, right? Right is in reference oh, oh, okay. to the video. To so, the video, so it would go out to his left side. Yes, out to his okay. left side, out to second okay. base, but to right in Got reference it. of the video, because I think Rufus was kind of describing it in that in that manner. That's okay. That's what I just wanted to clear up. Yeah, yeah there we go. But again, like that, in terms of stuff, I would potentially change. I would talk to his pitching coach and be like, Hey, like, I don't, I know. Cause a lot of people don't like that foot landing in that, in that way. People would try to change that. They try to make it more straightforward towards the, towards the plate. But if he's creating this big wave out and then pulling back with his left quad, that that's what makes him so, so good at what he does. I wouldn't want to change that. Like that big, sweep out to the side and then pull it back in like that's where he's generating a ton of energy at his front foot and that's what's channeling back up into the pitch right well if that foot's facing out and that tibia is facing out and that that uh ilium's facing out wouldn't that foot position be what's allowing him to actually push to stay in and push back over to the right potentially uh yes so if you move to try to keep his foot straight, it's gonna it's gonna change the way the energy wave hits up, and you may not you may actually be undoing what he's the it, strategy it he's using to do well. It, it wouldn't be as big of a wave, so it'd be less energy, and it wouldn't be pushing. It wouldn't have the same kind of uh, deflection up into his right. It would be back, be straight backwards. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so could that potentially lead to an arm problem? What would um, his his throwing motion? Because it's got how, it's got how he's doing it right now. You're saying yes, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I I I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm just looking at it as it's going up, and something has to change going up, right? And so, you know, this, this, going you know, up. what, so I guess I don't have what we talked about earlier. I don't have an image of what's it supposed to look like and what's he doing. Right. Um, I, what I would say is that what it looks like right now is pretty damn good because he's leading the league in strikeouts. Um, 
I don't I don't know if it would I agree with you. Again, I, I don't it wouldn't change anything, but I'm just I'm just wondering if if let's say let's say you had a 14 year old or 13 year old that did the same thing. I I wouldn't um uh can you guys hear me? The train's going by. Yep, I can hear um, uh, I wouldn't be adverse to, to fixing that problem in the weight room. With him, I wouldn't because of that's what got him there. Right. If that makes sense. Right. right. Yeah, I don't. Is that the way that I would coach pitching mechanics for a seven-year-old? No, probably not. But over the course of his development, he figured out that, holy crap, if I do that, I can I can throw elite velocity on my fastball. And and a lot of times you you have to deviate from that from that norm of what 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 you'd expect things to look like in order to generate these crazy amounts of energy and force, right? Okay. So Let's assume he probably was throwing like that most of his life, right? Or some form of that. Right. So if I if I got him as a 13 or 14 year old and I tried to fix that a little bit, give him a, maybe a little more is it external rotation on the right side? Uh he he's got he's got a decent amount of that. So it would be like what a pitching coach would probably change would be like his left foot placement. Okay. Okay. That's so they'd go idea. there first. Yeah. So, so if I change his left foot placement, would that, would that harm him at, at, and I'm talking about 13 or 14, I wouldn't do it, you know, now, or I'd be very, very hesitant to do it now because yeah. that's what got him there. Right. Right. But at 13 or 14, he's not there. So could it could could it could you possibly lessen <laughs> the chance of injury later on if you fixed it early on? I don't know because I, I don't know if he's injured right now or not. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, and I'm not. I, I don't think how he's throwing is setting himself up for a potential injury. Okay, anything. that's what I want to know. Okay. If so if anything, Cass maybe if we changed his foot right now, that would that would be more likely to set him up for an injury because I would put him deeper into his turn right. sooner, and that would push more of the energy further out into his arm sooner. I'm talking like an elbow or something like that. And hence, I don't work with pro athletes, and that's why. <laughs> <laughs> He's Michael Jordan, man. Yeah, Michael Jordan. I don't want to screw him. him up, right? Don't touch him. So, Campo, a lot of our discussion today, is this what you do on your sub stack with Mike K? Uh, we delve into some of this stuff. I haven't really done, like, we've done some movement breakdowns. I'm going to be doing a movement breakdown on one of the pitchers that I've been working with. Right now, we're pretty, we're in its infancy in terms of stuff we've been putting out there. I would imagine that this could be like a direction in which it would it would go. Um, Mike's been doing a lot of stuff in terms of just looking at internally how fluid kind of moves around inside your body when you're doing a golf swing. And he's got some cool stuff in terms of like looking at how the force plate kind of changes as he tracks like the the movement through your body. So and then he's been setting up some like interventions and how you can potentially change it. Um, what I've been talking about so far is a particular case where I have a left-handed pitcher who did have some elbow issues. And so I kind of like break down what's happening at his elbow. And then I break down what was happening at his wrist and his shoulder and how that's influencing the elbow. And then we went over some exercises that I was using to change that. And then the next post is going to be like, okay, here's his whole presentation. Here's his throwing mechanics. And then this is what the, the whole program kind of looks like because of that. Okay. 
And so again, like it, it's, we're still young in the infancy of doing this. We've only been doing it for a month, but this is hopefully what a lot of it will be like. We want it to be like the name of it is context driven. So we want it to be specific to this individual. Cause again, like kind of what Rufus is talking about, we have this picture perfect. What if a 13 year old threw like this, what would it look like? Right. So we have this like general idea of what things should look like. But then when we look at a particular individual, a lot of that starts to fly out the window. And he's a great example of it in terms of like, okay, if that's your, if that's your standard deviation, and this is the mean of what we want things to look like, a lot of your greater athletes are probably going to live at these fringes of that, of that deviation. And that's probably why their, their performance is as good as it is. So part of what we need to do as practitioners is look at not just try to get a gauge of like, okay, what is this big distribution that I'm looking at? But it's like, okay, where does this individual fall within that distribution? And is that useful for them? Is that not useful for them? What's the situation they find themselves in, right? So again, with this basketball, with this basketball player, um, that's her, that's the specific context that we were trying to change with her, with her foot. For other people, I might try to do the exact opposite of that. Just really depends on, again, who, who are they? What, what kind of situation do they find them in? And then is this, is this right? Is this wrong? And do we have the capacity to kind of see enough of this in terms of insight to, to address some of this stuff, right? Awesome. So, Sounds like what, what we need. Um, I got I got a question before we let you go. Sure. What the heck is a sub stack? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I'm still stuck on Instagram. <laughs> well, I so um, I was exposed to it maybe oh like six months ago or seven months ago at this point. So what what sub stack was originally kind of marketed and created for was a lot of um, journalists or being deplatformed for some of the things that they were discussing. Uh -huh. um, they set up Substack so that it would be their own um, uh, independent publishing. So they, you know how when you log on to like, I don't know, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times and you try and read a, new, a news article and then it hits you with like a paywall and it says like, you know, pay $3 and you can keep reading. So what Substack is, is essentially that, but now instead of, New York Times getting all of that money. It's the journalist that's getting that that payment for the subscription. So it's just a platform for um, blogs, podcasts, uh, newsletters, journals, things like that, to where the the individual can be the the sole prop proprietor and distributor of that information. I'm not I'm not so worried about my stuff being deplatformed on Instagram, but this is a better platform from a business sense and from a uh, information sense to where I can't really post a 20 minute clip on Instagram and expect it to get um, a whole ton of traction or a whole ton of conversation, but I can do that and put it on to, onto Substack and then I can be financially incentivized to continue to do that just so I'm not spending, because we, we spend a considerable amount of time doing it. We spend, I don't know, I mean, I, I'd say just even today, I spent at least two or three hours putting together what I wanted to talk about. And then I was thinking about it two or three days before that as well. So there's, there's time and thought to be placed into that. We need to, we need to make sure that we're not just okay, throwing so, it out there on the ether. So I have to pay to join your sub stack, right? Yes, it's a thousand dollars, and it's your entire. I need your entire life savings in order to to pay for it, Rufus. Well, if you get a thousand dollars out of me, you will have my entire life savings. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, so, Corey, do you have anything else? My my brain's fried. I got nothing else. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> that was awesome, Campo. Um, so sure. tell tell us where we can find you. Tell us about that sub stack. And, and so um, I'm, I'm mostly on Instagram. I'm trying to get my own website going since I'm doing my own thing now. 
Um, and then if you find me on Instagram at what, what even am I Campo Campo underscore DPT or something like that. And then the, the sub stack stuff is there's a link in my Instagram bio and then same for uh, Mike K as well. So I think he's Mike K DPT on Instagram and then the link to the sub stack is, is in the bio as well. So, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. That was, that was unbelievable. For I sure. It was great. That, that, that was, was really, a good time. That was really great. Um, it was a fun time. Hopefully we can do this again. And uh, if I get to Arizona, I'm going to go to Scottsdale. Please do, man. I would, hey, I would welcome you into the gym and I'd make sure you'd have a, a wheelie desk chair right in the middle of the place so you can watch everything you need to watch. Okay. <laughs> I just, you, your brain would be fried from all the questions I'd have, I'd have for you. Why, oh, are, you doing, fine. why are you doing that? So uh... I, I, I need to, eventually I'm going to be established enough to start taking and trying to situate apprenticeships and stuff like that. But oh, cool. For, for right now, no, just because a lot of I, I don't want to waste anyone's time if they're coming out here. So that's oh, that's all. No, I think that's great. Um, I know Corey's starting a little apprenticeship that he's doing that I think he's had. Like, he just started, yeah. right? One or two. Well, I just have two, had two BT students back in nice. uh, January through May. Yeah. Good. We 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 need it. A lot of times the the PT clinicals and the internships just turn into free labor and. and that's great from a business standpoint, but it's terrible from a future of the industry standpoint. So learning standpoint. Exactly. My uh my fourteen year old grand or fifteen year old grandson today told me he might want to be a physical therapy. And I said, Well, guess what? I know just I know just where you're going. So <laughs> <laughs> perfect. There you go. He's got you've got plenty of connections to turn him into a, a great right. practitioner. So that's right. So uh but but thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. Sure. And uh, hopefully we can do this again if you want. Yeah, to. Absolutely. Such a great talk. God dang, I love to do this again sometime. Anytime, yeah. guys. Hundred percent. So, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks. Thanks. You guys. See you, man.